Hello and welcome to TLC Talks BFRB Basics. I'm Jen Monteleon, the Interim Executive Director of the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. We're so excited for this conversation today. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. This is a health education webinar offered in a safe, respectful, and welcoming environment for everyone attending today. Leading our discussion today are two experts in the field of body-focused repetitive behaviors, Dr. Charles Mansueto and Dr. Suzanne Mouton-Odom. Dr. Mansueto is a clinical pioneer, founder and director of the Behavior Therapy Center of Greater Washington, where he's been involved in the study and treatment of hundreds of BFRB patients. He is a founding member of TLC's Scientific Advisory Board and also serves on the scientific advisory boards of the IOCDF and Tourette Syndrome Association of Greater Washington. He chaired the first national symposium on trichotillomania in 1990 and continues to investigate, publish, and speak about the disorder. Dr. Mouton Odom is a licensed psychologist who completed her doctoral residency at the University of Texas Medical School, Houston. She is a clinical assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine and president of Psych Tech Limited Technology for Psychology. Dr. Mouton Odom serves as vice president of the board of directors and vice chair of TLC's scientific advisory board. She has published numerous scientific journal articles, presents both internationally at professional conferences and is a co-author of three books. Please help me welcome Dr. Mansueto and Dr. Mouton Odom. All right. All right. Shall I begin, Suzanne? You can... yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Let's get started. Well, uh, you can put on the first slide just for a moment. Okay. The, the uh, title side. I just want to say that uh, we're both happy to do this. I'm Charlie Mansueto and Suzanne Mouton. You can tell us apart, I think. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is uh, going to be a whirlwind tour of uh, B BFRBs because we know there are some newbies among you uh, who haven't, uh, who still are being educated about this and also very sophisticated, knowledgeable folks. So we're gonna try to, to do a good job of, of at least presenting the basics and alluding to some of the more uh, <clears throat> subtle elements about BFRBs and its treatment. So let's start right, right away with the uh, first question of what are BFRBs? And BFRBs are um, a cluster of very human activities <clears throat> that are uh, that are in some way damaging to the physical self, to the skin, the hair, and other parts of the body uh, that are recurrent. That means uh, they uh, occur over and over. There's a pattern to it, and individuals just can't stop it. It, it does seem to have a, a power behind it that is beyond ordinary will and self control. Uh, and ultimately, it causes degrees of distress and impairment for the individual. Uh, it's not OCD. It's related to a number of other disorders. So it is diagnosed as a, an OCD-related uh, OCD, um, disorder, among other, as hoarding is and so forth. So we think it's related in certain ways, but it's different. It requires different treatment. And that needs to be very clear that the same may, uh, uh, pharmacological agents, the drugs, and the behavioral techniques that apply to OCD are uh, don't apply equally to uh, BFRBs. And here, what are they then? Well, the first two, uh, trichotillomania or skin picking disorder, that's a term I, I prefer, uh, and uh, excoriation disorder, or I'm sorry, trichotillomania or hair pulling disorder, HPD and for sure, uh, excoriation disorder or skin picking disorder, they are both equally applicable terms. These are older terms and they sound more medical, I guess, so the, they were put into the uh, DSM, but they are official disorders and therefore they have all the uh, power and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, let's say, a notoriety as other existing disorders. However, there are a number of other uh, BFRBs that aren't ordinarily uh, talked about or widely known. Uh, well, of course, very common is compulsive nail biting. And that is a, uh, ha again, has sort of a fancy Greek name, but it's uh, by everybody knows about nail biting and many people have done it or do it. So uh, that's uh, one of the forms. Compulsive nose picking sounds funny, 
because it's such a common, you know, ordinary human uh, characteristic, not always in public, but, you know, uh, it's there and it's just part of being human. And, uh, but it is quite serious at times. People can pick through the septum, that uh, it, tissue that separates the nostrils, causing a number of, uh, of medical complications and, uh, and social issues this is a whistling sound and so forth that makes, and it's very hard to treat. Uh, it has to, devices are put in to block that because uh, it's hard to repair uh, cartilage. Uh, compulsive inside biting of the lips, the, the cheek, uh, all of that, the picking of nails, cuticles, dry skin, bottom of the feet and so forth uh, are all under BFRBs, but as I mentioned, only the first two are, are uh, official. Uh, next slide. Okay, so who gets it? Uh, well, the prevalence rate is, it's uh, as we now know and was never believed before, it's a quite common form of, of human activity. Uh, the the uh, estimates go as high as 5% for hair pulling disorder and as high as 5% uh, for skin picking disorder. That means combine the two and you have 10% of persons now pick any any population, look at a school or look at where you work in the office or look at uh, a crowd of people. That, look, that means that many as, as one in 10 are experiencing or have experienced one of the two disorders. So it's not that outlandishly unusual for human beings to fall into one of these, what I think of as human traps. Uh, the age of uh, the gender distribution, about the same, uh, presenting uh, it favors females uh, at, at nine to one. We know that that's about the clinical population. And yet there's some controversy as there is with the, with the raw numbers, how many people do these things because ev evidence is derived from uh, studies with too few samples or, or two different criteria for how to measure these things. Anyway, uh, it's about uh, considered nine to one, similarly with uh, skin picking, except for among children. When each of the these disorders uh, strikes children, um, it, uh, it looks about equal. It's only as it moves toward adulthood through adolescence that it, is, uh, uh, it begins to look like more females at least uh, showing up and recognizing their condition and wanting help for it. Uh, the onset, it, uh, both cases, uh, adolescence is a prime time. That's very interesting. We don't know if it's because chemical, physiological, maturational changes in in um, in adolescent, or whether it's social pressures or or experiencing the full cultural pressure of having nice hair and nice skin. We don't know why, but uh, it's being explored uh, quite diligently. There are people who start earlier, and uh, uh, in children, there is what may be a more benign form. Uh, kitty trick or a child trick that is uh, uh, maybe a different animal, not necessarily predictive of a of a, a lifelong or 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 a uh, years long characteristic, but it could be, and we don't know how to distinguish those that will self abate, st stop on its own, or ones that do require some uh, attention and and uh, and, and work. Um, Skin picking uh, onset, a little bit different because there are, looks like three times that skin picking starts. Among children, uh, a little bit of a peak, uh, a little bit more than with, with uh, uh, hair pulling. And why? Maybe kids pick up mosquito bites, aberrations, scabs on their skin, and they're a little more prone to get these things maybe than many adults. That could be why. But it also, there's another peak, not quite as high as in adolescence, but another peak uh, in age of 30 to 40. And it's not really well understood why that is the case. It may be associated with other kinds of, of problems like concern about body image and so forth. Um, the question of, are we genetically programmed to have and have not these, these problems? The answer seems to be that uh, through genetic and family uh, studies looking at the uh, the appearance in various family constellations. Yeah, that does seem to be some genetic heritability factor, but it's not that strong. So there's questions about should I have children? Will they have the same disorder? We don't even consider those legitimate questions because if there's a hered heredity factor, it probably is through a vulnerability, 
not to uh, a, 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 a demand that that this will occur. And uh, but there are twin studies that show that identical twins are more likely to have it than fraternal twins. And yet, even those are not uh, are just suggestive, not definitive. Uh, so again, it's not uh, the genetic component very likely to be there in some form, but it's not as powerful as many people are concerned about. As far as comorbidities, it's a rule, not the exception. People are complicated. So what we see most often, I suppose, are depression, which may be secondary. If you had struggling with these kind of ailments, it's very likely that, that, uh, that uh, it, it takes its toll in terms of happiness and, and sense of, uh, you know, uh, quality of self and so forth and experiences. Um, so it, uh, there are other disorders though that appear ADHD, uh, body dysmorphic disorder, very highly associated with skin conditions and probably uh, prevalent in a subtype where there is a exaggerated concern about uh, imperfections or perceived imperfections that may produce drastic efforts to correct those, to correct those and, and, and to address those. Um, other things, uh, there are bipolar disorder, like you might expect, Human beings can have a variety of coexisting conditions, and there are very many ones that eating disorders, uh, all of those substance abuse, alcoholism, these do appear, but in lower uh, amounts and uh, perhaps getting more comparable to what ex is experienced in the general population. And finally, an area, uh, sensory dysregulation. This is a, a skin picking hair pulling are highly sensual experiences. The fingertips are involved, the feeling of touch, uh, the, uh, the eyes, what we see in the mirror and what we see on our bodies. These all are triggers for the problem and uh, what we try to achieve to correct them, smooth out the skin, uh, get stuff out of pimples, uh, to uh, uh, correct, uh, uh, get rid of hairs that we don't want or hairs that are too sharp or too curly or too greasy or whatever. All of these are through the, the sensory channels. And it may be that persons with, uh, with ADHD uh, have a heightened sense uh, of, uh, of sensitivity to, uh, to sensory issues and uh, may be more reactive to them than others. But again, that's just purely speculation. So I'm gonna turn it over back to you, Suzanne. Please take, take us through the next part. Sure. Um, if I could get it to advance, that would be fantastic. Um, well, hold on. There we go. Um, so thank you, Charlie. I'm going to talk a little bit about some common myths about hair pulling and skin picking that over the years we have become aware of, and we want to always dispel rumors or misinformation that comes from a variety of different sources. It could be a therapist, it could be a doctor, it could be a friend, the internet. Um, but these are things that often are brought to us in therapy, and we want to dispel. The first being that BFRBs are the result of some sort of trauma or abuse or bad parenting, and it's it's simply not true. Many people with the BFRB present with loving, caring, amazing, supportive families. Now that is not to say that a person with a BFRB couldn't have had a trauma or a bad family experience or, or an abusive situation, but we see that as more of the exception than the rule. Um, and we know this because studies done looking at the incidence of abuse and trauma among people with at least hair pulling disorder and we're not higher than in the general public. And so we wanna dispel that as a rumor as like, this is something that causes people to engage in, in a BFRB. Um, the second is that BFRBs are a form of OCD. And it got a little confusing when um, the new DSM came out and now it's called a obsessive compulsive and related disorder. So it, it really confused matters and kind of reinforced this idea that this is just another form of OCD. And, and as Charlie has said many times, we see it more as like a distant cousin than a brother or a sister. Um, so there's some things in common with OCD and that the main being that BFRBs are repetitive, unwanted behaviors. Um, but then it kind of starts to get a little fuzzy beyond that. Um, the treatments for certainly the medication treatments are different the same medications don't work to reduce urges 
that, that serve to reduce OCD symptoms. Um, the process is a little bit different. People with BFRBs really like their BFRB for the most part. Um, not everyone. There would be some people who would disagree with that. Um, but people with OCD really feel um, like they don't want to do their rituals. They just feel compelled to. And so that's a big difference. People with BFRBs don't like the outcome of their pulling or picking, but they really kind of enjoy the process itself for the most part. There's something about it that's gratifying. Um, so that's another big difference. Um, ERP, which is the treatment of choice for obsessive compulsive disorder, is a, is a different process than what we do for BFRBs. Although sometimes we do incorporate some aspects of exposure response prevention into BFRB treatment, but they're not the same thing. That's the key. Um, the third is that BFRBs lead to other more dangerous psychopathology. Like, is my child going to become suicidal or become, um, you know, bipolar or some other, like this is a sign of things to come. And, and as Charlie mentioned, there are some other comorbid things that we do see happening in adults with a BFRB, but we're not sure if that's not the result of just having to live with a BFRB for so many years. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to lead to that. And, and that is all how the BFRB is handled in the family and in treatment um, along the way. Uh, the fourth being BFRBs are a form of self-harm or self-mutilation. We've heard a lot about this buzzing around lately on social media and on the internet. And um, self-harm and self-mutilation are very different processes than, than BFRBs. And we do not believe that BFRBs are the same process or the same disorder as self-harm and self-mutilation. That's a whole other hour-long discussion that I'm happy to have with anyone if you want to. But just know. For the basics, they are not the same thing. Your child or your friend or your, your loved one is not pulling or picking in an attempt to harm themselves. Um, and we'll talk about in a minute more what BFRBs are. Um, BFRBs are an easy, easy to stop and within a person's control. I even had a parent say this to me yesterday. My daughter doesn't do it around other people, but she does it privately so she can control it. And, and my answer was, you know, there's a lot of things that we all do in private that we don't do in public but it doesn't mean that we don't still engage in them when we're in private. And so, so I don't, so I don't use that as, um, as sort of a litmus test. We have to be careful with this assumption because I guarantee you, if a person could stop their BFRB, they absolutely would. And so it, this is not an easy to stop, easy to change behavior that a person is just neglecting to pay attention to or, or not doing. It's a lot more complicated than that. And then finally, BFRBs are a sign of dislike for oneself or a desire to be unattractive. Again, going back to this sort of um, self-harm, self-mutilation, underlying psychopathology, um, this is not what is driving a person to engage in their BFRB. So let's talk a little bit about what we do know, the truth about BFRBs. What we, what we see is that BFRBs are self-soothing, self-regulating behaviors. They, any behavior we engage in is done because it serves a function. If a behavior doesn't serve a function, it quickly dies off. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to really figure out what the function is. And Charlie and I, that's our job as therapists is to figure out for each individual, what is the function driving this behavior? And what we see is that the function can be internal and external. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. And over time, these behaviors become ingrained in a person's daily activities and habits and, and things that they just do that they become almost automatic or feel uncontrollable. And, um, and so, but they, but they, if you really look at the behavior and it may have started as, oh, I accidentally pulled a hair or I saw someone else pulling hair or I saw, I picked this thing off and, and then it got positively reinforced. And we said, ooh, that felt good. Or, ooh, I like the way it feels when that scab is gone. It makes it smooth. We feel something positive coming from that. That behavior is more likely to happen again. Um, and so that would be an example of sort of an internal um, kind of a, a, a self-regulating behavior. So, in, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this internal being thoughts and um, thoughts and emotions and sensations 
um, and awareness and external being places and activities and implements. But Charlie's going to talk about that in a minute. So what else do we know? We know that BFRBs occur in children and adults um, that are otherwise oftentimes highly functioning individuals, psychologically intact, intelligent, creative, lovely people. Um, and I think one of the biggest fears, especially for parents, is that what's wrong with my child and are they going to be in the company of um, really strange and unusual people? And the truth is, that's not the case. Um, and, and this is the beauty of, of, of a group or a conference or going to a workshop with other people suffering with the BFRB. As you see, these are lovely, high-functioning people who desperately want to change their behavior. Um, and finally, the truth is that BFRBs are treatable and should not define a person or become the center of their family structure or the center of their sense of identity. Um, BFRBs are only a small part of a person, not the defining aspect of them. And so our job is as therapists is to really help people to put things in perspective. Now that is not to say that BFRBs cannot have a tremendous impact on a person in their life. I'm not saying that. And Charlie's gonna talk right now a little bit about the impact that BFRBs can have. Um, but a lot of the work we do in treatment is to help people see all of the wonderful things, all the aspects of themselves or their child or their loved one that are valuable and wonderful and, um, and amazing and not to just see them as their BFRB. So I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie to talk a little bit about the impact. Okay. Well, um, you, one would think ordinarily that, that the impact of BFRBs is going to be related to the severity. I'm going to mention that as we get down to the emotional psychological <clears throat> impact of BFRBs. But I just want to mention that beyond the usual expectation that if you pull your hair, you're going to have cosmetic damage. And if you pick your skin, there's also going to be signs of it cosmetically. However, uh, as the uh, uh, activities become more severe, more persistent, uh, there can be very serious consequences of these things. On the skin picking side, there can be infections and scarring and even damage to underlying tissue when uh, in the at the more pathological or problematic end of the spectrum. On the minor end, there can be bleeding and and in fact, mild infections and and uh, scabbing and so forth that uh, that's evident. On the other hand, there can also be persons who don't seek out ordinary medical treatment because of the fear of being scrutinized by the dentist or doctor under bright lights who might see some of the evidence that they've been uh, been at their bodies and, and harming their bodies in some way. So embarrassing, so ashamed of that, that uh, refusing not to receive ordinary, ordinary medical care, medical checkups and so on. And that's a, a less known aspect of uh, the physical and medical impacts of, of BFRBs. Well, socially too, uh, there, it isn't unusual to find a degree of social anxiety associated with a BFRB. Why? because no one wants really for others to know that they have uh, this, these kinds of problems. And if, if they can, can camouflage it or hide it in, a, in some way, uh, they will do that and even deny it or, or uh, attribute the, the, the uh, cosmetic damage to other causes. So, uh, so that's, uh, but that makes a person secretive often, living a life of subterfuge and, and anxiety associated with, with uh, public disclosure, even to loved ones, even to persons who, who they've been married to and live with for many years, trying to hide the fact that they have this, this hidden problem. Financially, it can be very expensive. Obviously, the therapy can be expensive, but also the, uh, uh, the goods and services that are required to take care of oneself, the, uh, the skin creams, the visits to the dermatologist, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the loss of work because of bad incidents that may make an individual uh, have to call in sick for that day. Uh, there are, academically, there's a tremendous impact, people dropping out of school, causing, again, a financial loss to the family. So this is significant, the uh, part that isn't talked about ordinarily, uh, just the, the clothes that are bought to camouflage it, the hair pieces, the wigs, all of this uh, uh, causes a, a, a severe financial strain in many individuals. But it's the emotional and psychological impact that, that we're 
I guess, uh, as, a, as therapists and meeting more people over the years, thousands of people with these problems and seeing really, as Suzanne put, put it, very you know, wonderful people who are hurt very badly, have been hurt. Emotionally, they, they are very anxious and shy sometimes because of the, the unwillingness to engage folks in, in a more aggressive and appropriate way even at times. Uh, they, there's a certain sadness uh, an embarrassment, a shame, a feeling of freakishness that that pervades this sort of disorder. Why? Because, as Suzanne put it, and we know, others folk, folks say, if you don't like the effects, why don't you just stop? Well, we pointed it out. You can't just stop. And others should understand that, but often don't. And it's very perplexing to loved ones, family members who worry so much about the, the well-being and health of their children or want their Spouse to, to everyone to be as proud of their spouses and loved ones as, as much as they are. It hurts in so many different ways. So this these are not trivial and it's not just about hair pulling and, and skin picking. I'll end there. So uh, what causes them? Well, we're still <clears throat> struggling. I wrote a letter to the Washington Post where uh, an article uh, in an advice column, usually a very excellent advice column, uh, told the, a woman who was uh, pointing out her hair pulling problem that very likely she might have been uh, molested, sexually molested, and that needed to be uncovered and found first. And I, so I sent it, and they printed it the, in letters to the editor. But you know, I don't know how many people have that corrective thing. But we still find therapists who believe that that there's a deeper meaning to these things, that it's an attempt to, to make oneself ugly. They fear, individuals fear growing up as adolescents, so they are doing things to themselves that'll make themselves less attractive, maybe fear of sexuality and so forth uh, uh, in adulthood. Uh, it seems like nonsense, basically. Uh, the, as much as we try to look for these things, it, it doesn't appear to be uh, a factor that's present in any more, uh, probability than with ordinary populations and other clinical populations. Yes, there's, there's uh, evidence that degrees of trauma in childhood, even subtle ones, even repetitive ones, may be more associated, but certainly not the kinds of trauma we usually think of, physical, mental, psychological abuse. It doesn't mean they're absent in every individual. It just simply means we shouldn't paint with a broad brush when we consider those things. What has, has seemed to apply the greatest degree of uh, insight and uh, enlightenment are human learning, learning models. In other words, we know now that there are principles that underlie learning in humans and, the, and in animals as well, and some that, that we both respond to, like reinforcement, like associative learning, associating some things with other things that become uh, part of our conditioning experiences. Well, those applied to understanding many disorders has has uh, resulted in the application of these learning principles to in a therapeutic way to now turn them against the disorder. Uh, these are things that help us understand it based upon principles of learning. Now use, let's use those principles of learning, the cognition, emotions, and turn them against the problem. And it's where, that's what CBT is really. It's not that unusual CBT. What we do is unusual sometimes, but it's always based upon principles that operate in our ordinary lives, in ordinary spheres. So, so uh, it, it, unfortunately, there's that tendency to use psychological language and pathological language, but really these are very human experiences that could be understood in very human terms. At the same time, what people wonder, is there something wrong? Is there something fundamentally at the biological level? Are there genetic pushes pushing people in the wrong directions? Are there biochemical uh, uh, anomalies in the brain? Too much serotonin, too little serotonin, too much dopamine, too, too few dopamine, dysregulation of dopamine, dysregulation of norepinephrine and serotonin. Sounds very fancy, doesn't it? But as yet, there's been no nothing that differentiates uh, healthy normals uh, in a reliable way with brain scans, with chemical analysis, with uh, uh, you know anything really that shows a biological difference. And yet, uh, because certain drugs seem to help with certain disorders, backward thinking says, well, they drug, maybe that means that was something wrong with the, with the sense systems they're correcting. Well, maybe and maybe not. The, uh, uh, the taking aspirin and relieving a headache 
doesn't mean you had an absence of aspirin in your in your chemical system. Uh, it so we that backward thinking sometimes creates uh, uh, theories or notions, hypotheses that aren't always don't stand up over time. Finally, there are integrative models, and I think these are the best ones, the ones that don't deny the possibility of genetic pushes of biological underpinnings for these things, but also look carefully at the experiences of the individual, the beliefs, the values, the, the patterns, the habits, uh, the emotions. These all are derived from human learning models as well as biological models, as well as biochemical models. So to integrate these is really a fully constructive and comprehensive view of a very complex uh, set of human functions. To you, Sue. Thank you. So on that note, we're going to switch to talking see. about why do people pull and pick? Okay. Um, is that mine or yours? <laughs> What's that? Is that mine or yours? No, no, no. It's my turn. I'll chat. Okay. So um, why do people pull and pick? BFRBs are, as I mentioned earlier, functional behaviors. So what does that mean? And I mentioned internal and external triggers. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that. And then Charlie's going to get really kind of more clinical about how we deal with it. But to help kind of explain, set the stage for that, internal triggers are things that we experience in our body that make a BFRB more likely to happen, either to trigger the behavior or that happens during or after the behavior that also facilitate that behavior continuing to happen. So sensations on the body, that could be visual, it could be tactile, it could be olfactory, it could be taste, it could be auditory. Most commonly, it's visual and tactile. Um, seeing something that one wants to see, or like a pimple popping and the excoriate being released, or that someone doesn't want to see, like um, a blackhead or a hair that looks funky or out of place or off color. Um, and so <clears throat> these, these sensory experiences can both trigger the behavior as well as reinforce it. Emotions are also in internal and we can experience, um, it used to, we used to think it was just tension or stress that caused people to pull or pick and a reduction of tension or stress that, that reinforced it. And that is true for most people that with a BFRB some of the time. But almost everyone with a BFRB follows that with, but I also pull or pick with in response to these other emotions. When I feel bored or sad or excited or happy or angry, or these emotions can happen during or after the BFRB. So one might feel um, bored and then they get interested in their hair or skin and then following or during they might experience a, a less lessening of the boredom, um, which would be a positive um, experience. What we do see, unfortunately, is that when there is a positive experience during pulling or picking, it's almost always followed with a negative anger, frustration, guilt, one of those negative emotions. Um, and it may be that that positive emotion experience during is enough to reinforce it. And the third internal trigger and in reinforcing factors are thoughts or beliefs. Um, and these could be, um, you know, hairs that are out of place, don't belong, or those thick, coarse hairs um, make me look ugly. I, they must be removed. Um, a belief about I can't focus unless I am picking or pulling. I won't be able to get my work done. So it, it um, and it also could be, so those are all thoughts or beliefs about pulling or picking, but they could also be thoughts or beliefs about something else, like just general life worries. People pull and pick oftentimes when they're worried or thinking through life situations. And some people even have a belief that pulling or picking helps them to think about their life situation somehow in a better way or a more efficient or effective way. External triggers or reinforcing factors include motoric movements um, and, and sort of things that have to do with the place. So places, activities, um, it might be sort of sitting with your arm propped up on the couch and the hands right here. It could be premonitory movements like face touching, stroking, stroking of the hair, that then leads to, oh, I identified a particular hair or part of my body that I'd like to pick. Could also be time of day. We know that people pull and pick more in the evening, sometimes late evening than in the morning. 
Um, it could be the presence or absence of other people. Most uh, most people report that they tend to pull or pick more in privacy rather than around others, although that's not always the case. Um, and then the presence or absence of, of sort of implements or external environmental things such as bright lights in the bathroom, mirrors, tweezers, um, things that would facilitate the BFRB um, to happen. So one might go in the bathroom and plan just to use the restroom, but then there's a bright light and they start looking and they see, oh, look, I've got tweezers. And then suddenly the behavior happens. Um, so both are important. And when we do treatment, we're looking at both internal and external factors that either cue the behavior or reinforce the behavior. Um, so what does good treatment look like? Um, cognitive behavior therapy is the evidence-based treatment of choice for BFRBs. And this has been for decades. Um, we want to understand why the behavior is happening, the who, what, when, where, how. Um, then we select the interventions that target uh, the functions of the behavior. Um, so if a person is seeking sensory stimulation, we find alternate sensory things. If a person is seeking to reduce a negative emotion, we might suggest other ways to reduce the negative emotions or to increase positive emotions. Um, if awareness is an issue, suggesting certain things like mindfulness, um, to, to help increase one's awareness in the moment without judgment. Um, so there are all kinds of excellent lists of therapists um, treated in, tra trained in treating BFRBs on the bfrb.org website, the TLC's website. Um, and currently, and Charlie's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about the comprehensive behavioral model for understanding BFRBs as well as treating them, but that is the current state-of-the-art treatment endorsed by the TLC Foundation. And Do Dr. Mansueto just happens to be the author of that, of that model. Well, thanks, Suze. Um, <clears throat> and that's called COM or the Comprehensive Behavioral Model. So as some people say COMB, C-O-M-B, but it's, uh, it's just a, uh, a sort of a, a recognition of the complexity. And that was part of the early work in, in, uh, in uh, BFRBs to understand that individuals vary greatly in the manifestation, the patterns that they show. And uh, so the one size fit all treatment doesn't seem to be uh, uh, effective or, or even uh, sensible with the, these problems. And second, uh, the comprehensive, the comprehensive uh, effects of broad spectrum treatment to take into account many of the different kinds of factors that contribute to an individual's picking. So it's individualized and comprehensive. And that's what simply is stated by the comprehensive behavioral model of uh, BFRBs and the comprehensive behavioral treatment model, a treatment approach called COM. Well, <clears throat> this uh, ordinarily means that we try to educate people and have them on the same page by doing what we did today. Just give them an overview, let them know in a sense that, that we understand their problems, that we're not judging them, that this is gonna be a safe environment for you to communicate very difficult things, perhaps things you've never communicated to another individual. And it's not because I'm, I'm curious or, or voyeuristic. It's simply because if I know the elements, I'll be able to help with you to create a better program, a comprehensive program to address them and not missing any of the variables. Well, again, the shame factor is so critical that the preparation, we, we are more diligent and more patient during preparation because we understand that that it's gonna be difficult for people to say things. So we have to tell them in a, uh, certain things that, that they're embarrassed, particularly embarrassed about how much they do it and, uh, and what drives them to do it and where they pick and pull from. Uh, these can be very personal, very sensitive areas. And so unless we know that, we're not gonna be a good guide to get them out of the thicket of, uh, of the problem. Uh, and, and therefore we have to be so careful to work with the shame, to work with the embarrassment and, uh, and create a trusting uh, uh, environment for people to open up a bit and help us help them. Uh, identifying the function, well, in different contexts. Yeah, people pull differently in the, in the mirror in front with their magnifying glass and their, their bright lights than they might in bed when they, they're trying to get to sleep. So it isn't always the same solution. 
uh, that we're going to do. We're going to try to find solutions for the various and everybody, no one picks everywhere or pulls everywhere. They tend to have certain battlegrounds, the ones where the most damage is done. So we can address those and try to come up with individualized treatment approaches for them. And what are the treatment approaches based on? They're based on, on all of the complexity and, and trying to organize that complexity of being human and being concerned about the skin and hair and appearance in general. So we are looking at, at uh, uh, the uh, sensory issues. We've alluded to them. Suzanne has talked about cognitive, the, the emotions, the fancy language, technical language for thinking, cognitive thing, beliefs and ideas, affective, fancy technical language for emotions and feelings, motoric movement, uh, fancy language for what we do, what a body does, the way we move, the way we respond to the environment, and place the way the environment actually dictates what we do. We don't sit down when there's not a chair or something to support us. We don't say, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, you're welcome, unless someone has said thank you ordinarily, right? So we are responding to uh, cues, and so are these habits. So that's presents the places you have to be sort of alone most cases people don't like to to pick a pull when they when somebody's looking at them right in the face most uh most people don't like to pick a pull if they their hands are gunked up with paint or or uh or flour or or you know grease uh right so so they they want sometimes yeah, some manner of uh, appropriate conditions for the pulling to occur and we can use those things so sensory we can uh look at what cues them a sight a, a, the fingers touching the skin a close-up with a magnifying mirror well we can start to change the uh the use of the senses fingertips trained to move away from the body uh, uh usual fingers that that feel for imperfections on the skin or sharpness on the eyebrows uh, sharp hairs or or uh blemishes or bumps on the back or face well we can we can use various methods to uh impede and divert the ability uh, of people to have those senses automatically drive them into the patterns that is so powerful and it's often easier to stop habits uh i'm sorry either not begin habits than it is to stop them right once it's underway it's kind of carries us and throws us out whatever the habit is but if we can divert it and not start it in the first place and that's also part of the comprehend most comprehensive models including comb is to uh is to uh, ensure that we begin with understanding the early precursors of the problem to identify them there and take evasive and 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 protective action against those those problems early on uh beliefs have to be changed i mean if someone believes for pimple to to heal by squeezing the uh pus out uh then they're going to want to squeeze the pus out right but when they understand it drives the uh in infection in deeper, that it may cause scarring, that that uh, that scabs are nature's bandage. If you pick them off, it's going to have to work twice as hard, the natural tendency to heal, uh, because the scab, which is supposed to, you know, re reduce and fall off on its own, has now been, been hurt. Hair, uh, uh, stubs, when people call them that, calling them by ugly names, they're baby hairs. They'll grow and become beautiful hairs and fill in the the uh, whole garden of uh, of the uh, eyebrows and or, or scalp. Uh, but to call them stubs, the cognitive kind of overlay of oh, I can't stand these things, or you know, imperfections in the skin rather than just skin. You know. Uh, anyway, they all those kinds of ideas and senses create emotions. And that and emotions already when you they be, uh, these problems become generalized ways of dealing with stress. So a person who's who's bored uh, out of their mind, you know, waiting for something, uh, the hands may travel, and before they even realize it, hair may be on the floor or bleeding may occur. So these things have the habit note uh, element uh, can have a life of its own. Fingers can develop lives of their own. Fingertips can it becomes important search and destroy mechanisms. Uh, the, the habits that people have, the motor habits, motor is how much aware are you or 
am I of anything that's going on? And how much is sort of automatic? You know, we do automatically. Well, these problems get so well practiced, these patterns of skin picking, picking hair pulling, searching for, for uh, targets, all of them can so easily become uh, uh, automatic. And so we have to increase awareness and increase awareness may be as simple as uh, putting a Band-Aid on the fingertip so it feels it, or maybe as elaborate as buying one of the uh, devices that beep or buzz when you move toward you. But they don't take care of other things. They just take care of awareness. So they not a full thing. So finally, selecting intervention specific, it might be in the sensory mode to, uh, to if you like biting on the, on the scab or on the, on the uh, uh, hair bulb or the hair itself, maybe having something else, Tic Tacs or, or you know, and when I watch football games, I'll be nibbling on my, you know, and I'm excited about the plays or worried about my team. I'll be, uh, you know, so, but if I have popcorn in front of me, I don't nibble on my, my, my fingertips and fingernails. So, so that's a preventive action. And, uh, and it stops me from engaging in what is a fairly, whatever, well-entrenched habit. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all humans. Uh, so interv uh, interventions that are cognitively based, uh, correcting misconceptions, affectively based, uh, teaching people to deal with their emotions in ways that are not self-damaging, uh, habits, breaking habits, and breaking the the uh, by increasing awareness and taking uh, early action, and changing the environment. Uh, getting rid of the bright lights, getting rid of the tweezers that are right next to the magnifying mirror, putting away the magnifying mirror. All of these things are helpful. Uh, studying in a, not in a study carol, but in the main reading room where people are around, uh, around a person. All of these things are, are possible and how they apply to any individual depends upon the, that individual's patterns and their preferences for what they think is gonna work. And we try them out and experiment until we have an excellent package for each individual. So then we evaluate as we go along, do we need to change it? Do we need to add things? Are there trouble spots that we have to intensify our efforts? And that the rest of it is now you have a life, you have the coping mechanisms, you don't need us anymore. So please have a good one and enjoy the freedoms and the, uh, the, the lack of impediments that, uh, BFRBs have, have caused you over the years. I'll end that with that, Ruth, Suzanne. Oh, goodness. Okay. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to real quickly, and then we're going to take some questions, sum up the basics. So if you do nothing else, please be kind to yourself. People with BFRBs tend, and we know this through research, and it's been actually a new study came out that really reinforced the perfectionistic tendencies of people with BFRBs. Um, which can lead to if, if I am not perfect, then I am the opposite end of the spectrum, which can lead to really intense emotions. So be kind to yourself um, instead of hard on yourself. Know that behavior changes a journey. It is not a light switch. There's back and forth all through the journey, like any behavior. Um, one's diet, one's exercise program, start off great at the beginning of the year, usually by March, not so great. You know, got to re, you know, sort of re-energize yourself before the summer. It's a waxing and waning um, sort of progress with behavior change. And it's not perfect, right? So again, back to these perfectionistic expectations, it's, you know, going in the right direction. And, and I really encourage my clients to problem solve. If there is a setback, instead of getting into the emotion of it, let's just problem solve. Well, what, what was working? What, what could you have done differently in that situation? How would you do it differently next time? Instead of getting into the, you know, I messed up, I screwed up um, kind of a talk. Know that you're not alone. As Charlie pointed out, there are millions and millions of people on this earth who engage in BFRBs. And, and the TLC Foundation is a wonderful place to connect with those people. Behavior therapy is helpful, but know that it requires some effort and energy, just like my diet and exercise program. We got to work at it. And no one can take away your urges, but we can teach you how to manage them. Um, and, and, and know that sometimes they're going to be hard and we got to wade through that. And that timing is everything. Um, sometimes people come to therapy and they're, it's not the greatest time. And so we have to encourage them. Maybe they have too much going on or they don't have the effort and energy to devote at that point in time. And um, 
waiting even a month or two can really um, afford them the opportunity to get to a point where they have more space, um, more bandwidth to put energy and effort into it. So real quick, I just want to talk about some resources. The TLC Foundation is amazing. Um, there's some books that um, Dr. Mansueto and other colleagues have published. Um, and then coming soon, Dr. Mansueto and I and Ruth Gollum are publishing the Comb Treatment Guide. So look out, therapists, you're going to have a guide coming your way later this year and um, a compendium of, of behavior therapy, but also a workbook that will go along with it. We're excited about that. And then there's some websites and a host of other amazing resources out there. Thank you both for your time and dedication to our community. We are very grateful for you. To the TLC staff for putting this event together, thank you so very much. And for everyone attending today, thank you as well for being here. Don't forget to help us by completing the post-event survey, which is now linked in the chat. Again, we appreciate you joining us today and we hope you have a great day. Thanks everyone.